a pot friend. Don't be shy. Uh, looks like he's got a, a note or something. You got a note there, pot friend? Yeah, all right. Let's see. Let's see what this note says. Thanks, pot friend. Good evening. Please enjoy my gift. An elaborate review from I Am Error. I guess we've got another elaborate review from I Am Error. Thanks, buddy. Let's check it out. On June 12th, 2019, at E3, rest in peace, From Software announced their next game, Elden Ring. Just about three months after the release of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, a noted departure from the Dark Souls formula many fans had come to love, its suggested return to a medieval high fantasy setting immediately garnered interest from the developer's die-hard fans. Aiding this perception was the unveiling of a co-writer, none other than Game of Thrones author and high fantasy living legend George R. R. Martin. Imagine if J.R.R. Tolkien teamed up with Shigeru Miyamoto or Neil Gaiman with Tim Schafer. It was a match made in PR heaven. Then, radio silence. For two years, From Software toiled at Elden Ring, never revealing much about their project until it was almost done. Questions swirled around the game. Just how involved was the famed author? What kind of game would Elden Ring end up being? How could it possibly live up to the hype of Dark Souls, whose reputation only seems to grow with each successive year? In February 2022, fans got their answer in the critical and commercial juggernaut, Elden Ring. It's too early to say exactly what Elden Ring's impact on the gaming industry as a whole will be, but suffice to say, it's going to have a fairly large one, no matter what shape its influence takes. This elaborate review is not an attempt to tell you what's great or terrible about Elden Ring. Plenty of other people have given their thoughts on the matter, and while some are more persuasive than others, I find the entire pageantry of ranking games based on quality to be boring, as we'll see more in part 4. Instead, this video is an attempt to describe what Elden Ring means, what its influences are, what it can tell us about games. In it, there are four sections you're free to watch in any order though I've arranged them in my preferred sequence. In the first, I connect Elden Ring's take on the open world genre with a far older game, The Legend of Zelda, and ask if they seek to accomplish the same goals. In the second, I discuss one of the biggest complaints regarding Elden Ring, that it is unbalanced, and try to figure out how we can tell if a game is poorly balanced and if it matters, if one is. In the third, I discuss my favorite character in Elden Ring, the Mimic Tear, and why I believe this solemn little buddy tells us more about the kind of game Elden Ring wants to be than almost anything else in the game. Finally, in the last section, Elden Ring is not a 10 out of 10, I trace the history of video game review scores and ask if they really help us understand Elden Ring's greatness, or if they ultimately detract from the experience of playing and understanding the game. This elaborate review hopes to show you that Elden Ring is more than a 10 out of 10, more interesting than perfection. I hope you'll stick around till the end to find out if you agree. Before we get any further though, making these multi-hour reviews takes a lot of my time and energy. I've been living and breathing Elden Ring for a couple of months, and while it's certainly a game worth somebody's time, you could help make it worth my time by becoming a patron of the channel. You can find the link down below. As a patron, you get special access on our Discord channel, some behind the scenes content, director's commentaries, and some small power in deciding what videos I'll make next. So please consider supporting the channel if you've got the means. Now, on with the show.
Elden Ring is, by all accounts, an incredibly novel game. Like Breath of the Wild five years before, it manages to take the often stale genre of open world games in a fresh direction. In a critique of Cyberpunk during the early days of this channel, I asked, is Cyberpunk 2077 just another open world game? And I argued most open world games have similar struggles which result from their open design, which ultimately fails to live up to their promise to the player of go anywhere, do anything. Yet games like Grand Theft Auto and Minecraft still try to embody this kind of freedom. Cyberpunk clearly draws from their lineage, but does Elden Ring? I don't think so. Despite their similar genre titles, booting up Elden Ring and exploring Limgrave, its first area, reminded me of an even earlier progenitor, The Legend of Zelda. Not Ocarina of Time or Breath of the Wild, no. I mean The Legend of Zelda for the NES, released in 1986. It may be strange to start this elaborate review of Elden Ring by talking about Zelda, but the seeds were planted all those years ago. No game came to my mind more, particularly in my first 10 to 20 hours of play, than Zelda. Not Sekiro, not Dark Souls, not Breath of the Wild. I immediately came to the conclusion that Elden Ring is 2022's fulfillment of Zelda's core promise. In this section, I want to explore that promise, how it came to be, why audiences found it so gripping, how it morphed over time both within the Zelda franchise and beyond, and finally, how Elden Ring asks and answers the same questions The Legend of Zelda did despite the 36 years between them. I mean something rather specific when I describe the promise of a video game. This section is about The Legend of Zelda's promise to the player, but in general, I believe most, perhaps all, games give a promise to their players, which facilitates the player's buy-in. Because unlike other media, games require the tacit cooperation of the player and designer to be experienced. The promise is not the game's genre, though the two are often related, because genre describes the cultural conventions a media adheres to, while a promise is the individual relationship between a game and its player. The promise is also not the game itself, but the idea of the game. Promises can shift in meaning depending on who you ask, but they fundamentally set up expectations for the kinds of emotions the game will inspire in the player. An easy example of discerning a game's promise is Thief, whose promise is summed up in its single word title. If you were to boot up Thief and be greeted with Gears of War, it wouldn't matter how good the game was, the promise was broken. Even Deus Ex or Deathloop, games ostensibly in the same genre of Thief, do not have the same promise for who the player is, what they do, or what emotions the game will convey. Still, critical for our study today, multiple games can have the same promise, and I believe at their core, The Legend of Zelda and Elden Ring share the promise they give the player. That's what I'm here to prove it, at least. Also, I know Zelda refers to the entire franchise to most, but when I say it for the rest of this section, I am specifically referring to the first game in the series. If I mean another game, I will say that game's subtitle, okay? Okay. To understand the promise offered by The Legend of Zelda, let's rewind the clock and consider the mind that made it. Shigeru Miyamoto, who is mostly famous nowadays for a quote involving delayed video games. Two pieces of established lore regarding Zelda's development help us understand the promise it gives to its players. The first is Miyamoto's childhood. As a child, Miyamoto loved to explore the river valley around his village with its shrines and bamboo forests. One day, before he even turned 10, he found a big hole in the ground, but it was too dark to explore. He came back the next day with a lantern and was amazed to find an expansive cavern. As a profile for the New Yorker explains, 
Miyamoto has told variations on the cave story a few times over the years in order to emphasize the extent to which he was surrounded by nature as a child and also to claim his youthful explorations as a source of aptitude and enthusiasm for inventing and designing video games. The cave has become a misty but indispensable part of his legend. To Miyamoto, what the cherry tree was to George Washington, or what LSD is to Steve Jobs. Man, Steve Jobs did LSD, that makes so much fucking sense. Miyamoto's stories of his childhood are so often repeated that I remember learning about them from gaming magazines when I was around the age he was when he was exploring caves. And as a child who spent her summers in Wisconsin's rural Driftless, they reminded me of the forests and hills I explored growing up. One time, me and a neighbor even saw a bear across a field and quickly retreated with our tails between our legs to the safety of my grandma's home. These experiences in nature helped shape who I was, so it was easy for me to see how they could also shape Miyamoto, and by extension, one of my favorite video game franchises, The Legend of Zelda. More important than the specifics of the story though is how it informs The Legend of Zelda's goals. Essentially, Miyamoto wanted to recreate that feeling he had as a child inside an NES game, paint a world that felt vast and unknowable, where the story of exploring that world, the player finding their own holes in the ground, so to speak, is as important as the official characters and plot handed to the player. So at the beginning of the game, Link is handed a sword, told it's dangerous out there, and is set loose on that world. Various mysteries pervade this land, like the strange lost woods, an island in the middle of a lake, or bombable walls and burnable bushes hiding secrets beneath their surprisingly fragile exteriors. While the manual of the game certainly helps the player understand what's going on, Zelda is a game which seeks to replicate the feeling of being in wilderness, and fills that wilderness with a childlike sense of imagination. Magical items to find, dragons to be slain, and of course, princesses to save. The second piece of lore which establishes Zelda's identity is the game Miyamoto developed alongside it, Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. is a mostly linear experience, with Mario moving from left to right, overcoming obstacles, then moving from left to right some more. Linear is not bad. In fact, linear is often quite good. But The Legend of Zelda, which again, was in development at the same time as Super Mario Bros. was a prudent turn in another direction. Rather than the closed linear system of Mario, it would present an open and non-linear experience for the player. They would decide where to go, what to do, who to be. The decision to forego telling the player what to do opened the door to misinterpretation and mistakes on the player's end. What if they went to the wrong places, couldn't find the first dungeon, got stuck, and couldn't progress any further, as was my case and I suppose many for the, their original trot through Legend of Zelda? Yet, a nonlinear experience, just like in Miyamoto's days in nature as a boy, is far more rewarding when those paths are found, because it's not just the dungeon that's a reward for the player, but the path they took to get there. This non-linearity, perhaps above all else, is The Legend of Zelda's lasting legacy. I grew up acutely aware of Zelda because of its promise, as it was my uncle's favorite game, and my mom watched him play it as teenagers. Thus, my mom not only knew what Zelda was, but encouraged me to play it, getting me Link's Awakening as one of my first video games. I feel like I say this every elaborate review, but thanks mom. But let's get back on topic. What is the core promise of The Legend of Zelda? You know, the one that I was immediately reminded of when I started playing Elden Ring. As evidenced by the lore swirling around the game, it's a vast world of intrigue and mystery for the player to explore. No concrete direction, surprises around every corner. In The Legend of Zelda, the overworld is the game. It's large, arcane, hard to traverse, confusing and cryptic, but the game's soul is found in its unwillingness to explain itself or give directions to the player. 
Instead, Zelda wants to make you feel like you're on an adventure, lost in the excitement that comes with it. Yes, the game contains dungeons, but what truly matters is where they are all housed. If Zelda was just all its dungeons lined up together, it wouldn't be influential. It probably wouldn't even be memorable. When the player is told it's dangerous to go alone, given a sword and nothing more, the promise of the game is sealed. They won't be told what to do, or as Miyamoto puts it, I thought it would be more enjoyable to play the game without any help. The Legend of Zelda promises not to hold your hand. Sure, it may make some suggestions, but the world the player experiences is the game. Whatever they experience, find or don't find, will be all their own, because no one told them where to go or what to do. Beyond all else, this sacred overworld is the critically important element of The Legend of Zelda. It isn't remembered for its combat, role-playing elements, plot, and the main characters are mostly just generic copy-and-paste hero, villain, and princess. Later on, the series would develop in wild and fascinating directions, but at the starting line, there is significantly less to write home about, if not for that overworld tying it all together. The Legend of Zelda promises the player that if they invest their time, energy, and ingenuity into this world, it will pay them back, while making such investment easy and exciting. It may not be the first game to make this promise to the player, but it certainly popularized and codified the promise in a mainstream way, which is why we will use it as our primary linking point between Elden Ring and the distant past that inspired it. While seeds of this promise can be found in every Zelda game, as the series continued, the reluctance of the overworld to explain itself, and rather be explained through the player's play, became less prominent in the series' identity in favor of expanded lore, more straightforward dungeons, or interesting experiments in structure, until Breath of the Wild would return the series to its roots. Its three immediate 2D siblings, The Adventure of Link, Link to the Past, and Link's Awakening, all have their charms, but each strips back elements of Zelda's promise. They are less about naked, ambitious exploration, reminiscent of Miyamoto's forest excursions as a child, and more about setting the player off on THE quest. There ain't nothing wrong with a good quest, but the further a quest is thrust onto Link, the less a Zelda game feels like the NES debut, because a quest is fundamentally linear, and The Legend of Zelda is fundamentally non-linear. Ocarina of Time plays up the quest like a dramatic film, and while someday I'll make a video about Majora's Mask because it's obviously brilliant, the promise that the overworld is the game is cut off by its amazing temporal promise. Wind Waker, of all the games prior to Breath of the Wild, tries to evoke the spirit of the original game with its massive sea. But for me at least, while such traversals are iconic and memorable, the bulk of the game's effort clearly went into its aesthetic and islands, set pieces completely distinct from the game's more exploratory impulses. Breath of the Wild, though, one of the most obvious influences on Elden Ring's design, takes its cue from the original Zelda. It's a game which buys into the idea that the overworld is the game itself. Perhaps the funniest part of Breath of the Wild is you can go straight to Ganon's castle and try to take down the big bad without exploring any of the overworld. And yet, I bet for most players, the central castle of Hyrule barely registered until they started to get bored of its shrines and side quests and overworld. After a lengthy tutorial, Breath of the Wild does not hold your hand and more so than perhaps any Zelda game since the original, feels inspired by the same whimsical urge to explore that Legend of Zelda promised its players. Yet, Breath of the Wild also feels like a genuine update on those urges. The overworld is the game, yes, but the idea of that overworld, what it conveys, how it functions, is different than the NES game. The Legend of Zelda is an onion, 
with layers and layers, with dungeons and keys and mysteries all taunting the player. In this way, it offers a kind of proto-Metroidvania experience. What is hidden from the player is as important as what the player can see. Breath of the Wild's overworld does not have layers, or at least it isn't about layers. It is a flat expanse of possibility. The player climbs heights to find what thing to do next, and chooses which leads to follow up on, but rarely do those leads feel hidden from the player like they do in The Legend of Zelda. Instead, they feel like they're just hanging out, waiting to be found, if the player desires to start investigating them. The most hidden mysteries in the game are not barriers for the player to overcome, but oddities to make them smile. The game practically throws the experimental keys, the Sheikah Slate runes, to the player and tells them to go have fun, but no matter how fun those tools are, they fundamentally alter the promise of the game. Yes, play is non-linear, but the character of the overworld is different, less secretive, more open, less layered. The Legend of Zelda's promise is not simply open world game. It is not a large open playground to explore and mess around in. The player is directed at all times toward their goal of saving the princess. But how they get there, each twist and turn, decision and backtrack, is inevitably wholly their own. How they peruse the overworld's layers defines the player's experience in a way that doesn't feel as fully developed in Breath of the Wild or other Zelda games. Do you know what game does have layers, and lots of them, and whose overworld is the game? Well. I kind of already spoiled it, didn't I? Elden Ring. While the list of differences between Elden Ring and The Legend of Zelda are certainly vast, I believe they share the promise we've spent so long dissecting, and for the rest of this section, I'm going to prove it. After an opening crawl teasing the player with a quest and potential treasure, The Legend of Zelda famously starts by plopping Link at a crossroads, where he enters a small cave and receives a sword from a kindly gentleman who warns him that the world is dangerous. The player receives no further instructions from the game outside of paratexts like the manual. Elden Ring starts similarly, with the player getting their ass kicked, falling off a ravine, meeting a kind maiden who gives them some potions, essentially saying, hey, it's dangerous to go alone, take this before opening a door to reveal the beautiful and open Limgrave, a mostly directionless land. While Elden Ring still has some trappings of modern AAA game tutorials, it's hard to imagine a big ticket game with all the bells and whistles getting to this moment of freedom any quicker. From the initial sight of Grace, the player is free to go where they please. While the light of the Grace recommends a direction, it's at best a suggestion to the player. Like in Zelda, the player has quite a few options on where to go from the first step. They can head to the west toward a lake guarded by a powerful dragon. They can head to the east and discover a beach and a cave and all sorts of little knickknacks there. They can head north to discover a corrupted town filled with soldiers who attack them on sight. Each direction does not just contain enemies to fight or treasures to discover, but also those all important layers we discussed a moment ago. Catacombs and caves litter Limgrave's landscape, but the player is more likely to stumble upon them than seek them out, like in Breath of the Wild, since their openings are often small and imperceptible from a distance. It wasn't until my fourth playthrough that I found the Groveside Cave, which in some respects appears to be the first dungeon the player is supposed to experience, as the church's site of grace also points right to it. Meanwhile, the coastal cave has a secondary exit which leads to a dope, inaccessible island off the beach, which I completely missed my first time around. With all of these mysteries, all these layers, within a short walking distance of the game's first steps, Elden Ring telegraphs Zelda's influence. The overworld is the game. To help illustrate the point, let's compare Elden Ring to Dark Souls. Dark Souls has a lengthy tutorial section, with a boss and all, which ends up with the player dropped off at the Firelink Shrine. Like the first step and true to its namesake, the Firelink Shrine links to all sorts of areas within Lordran, but unlike Elden Ring, 
there are right ways and wrong ways to go. My first time playing Dark Souls, I was warned by my best friend that the game was difficult, but not to lose heart or give up. So naturally, when I encountered the unkillable skeletons in Nito's graveyard, I just assumed that this was the game's legendary difficulty, and I spent way too long fighting them, only to message my friend about it, and then he turned me around and sent me in the right direction. So yes, while Dark Souls has some amount of non-linear and open design, it pales in comparison to the diversity and possibility opened up by Elden Ring's overworld. In the immediate vicinity of the starting area, not counting West Limgrave or anything in Stormhill, or anything past the bridge, Limgrave contains a minimum of eight places of intrigue. If we assume the player could do these in any order they choose, which they can, that's eight factorial or about 40,000 possible configurations of these different sites of interest, you know, the, the sequence by which they uh, explore them. Most players won't even do all of them either, meaning their experience will be profoundly different not just because the order they did them in, but which ones they did and which ones they didn't even find. Compared to Elden Ring, the openings of Bloodborne and Dark Souls look positively cramped. Of course, many open world games construct such a non-linear open world for their players, but Elden Ring, and to a lesser degree The Legend of Zelda, succeeds because each stone turned over reveals something genuinely exciting for the player. No matter which path they take, it feels like there's always something interesting around the corner. The game feels rich and ripe with possibility. With endless layers, the player can continually uncover. Like Zelda, Elden Ring is so big, it begs you not to find all its secrets. Yet, it's so consistently engaging that you won't feel like you aren't missing out on anything because you didn't find X Catacomb or Y Boss. Even with tens of millions of players all experiencing Limgrave for the first time, none are bound to traverse it in the same way. A testament to both the starting area's impeccable design and just how much it wants to evoke The Legend of Zelda's feeling of exploring the forests of Kyoto on a hot summer day. Elden Ring fulfills Zelda's promise with its size. If you play the game without any guides, you are all but guaranteed to miss huge chunks of it. Heck, you can have a full AAA 80 hour run at the game and maybe experience half of it. Elden Ring constantly fakes you out with its size. Limgrave may feel big, but you hit Kaled and realize, oh wow, Limgrave is only half the map. Then you beat Godric and head up to Lyurnia and realize, oh no, I guess Limgrave is maybe a third of this game. Then you head up to the Atlas Bateau, thinking that this has got to be it, but that's maybe only the halfway point. Beyond this, at some point, you'll find an elevator down to the underworld, which, while not as big as the overworld, is still mighty impressive by itself and reveals a whole nother layer to Elden Ring's onion. Elden Ring is huge, and the first time player will likely be blown away by its size on like eight occasions. While the game only contains seven legacy dungeons, or those areas most reminiscent of levels found in the Dark Souls trilogy, it has so many landmarks, minor dungeons, sites of graces, oddities, shrines, portals, and other happenings as to feel rich and just full of possibility. Our premise that the overworld is the game helps put the massive amount of work that went into Elden Ring's world in context, reveal it as an effort to convey the importance of the world in how we understand the game. The lands between are not just big for the sake of being big. Large swaths of nothing do not act as padding between interesting locales. This isn't no man's sky. Almost every area is fleshed out and dynamic as Limgrave suggests. Some softer spots abound particularly Lyurnia, but the game maintains an absolutely surprising amount of density across its ridiculous runtime. The enormity of Elden Ring's map gives the player's quest weight 
and meaning helps them get lost in the adventure, just like many players did 35 years prior in The Legend of Zelda. Elden Ring is FromSoft's 2022 remake of Zelda's cryptic overworld. Zelda's overworld is not often easy to traverse. Not only does a player have to contend with enemies, but they need to contend with confusing geography and unexplained secrets. And I'm not just talking about the Lost Woods. It's quite easy to get lost in the NES game or not know where to go next. While the game's simple art style contributes, the primary function of the game's cryptic and non-existent direction is to fill the game with mystery, make discovery feel more earned and interesting. Elden Ring carries this torch with pride. As a simple example, once the player defeats the major boss, Radon, they watch a cutscene where a meteor crashes into the earth, though they don't know where. Later, if they return to West Limgrave, they will find a massive hole in the ground, leading to a secret eternal city, Nokron, prior to which was inaccessible. How the player ends up there, though, is incredibly multifaceted. They may have been purposefully doing Ronnie's quest, deliberately trying to reach the city to satisfy her. They may have just killed Radon because doing so can help unlock the main quest. They may, like me the first time I fought Radon, have stumbled upon him while exploring Kaled early in the game, and then accidentally found a giant hole in the ground after beating him because honestly I wasn't paying attention to the cutscene. I was really confused. I was like, where did this hole come from? The game sure has explanations for its mysteries like this, but it also sure doesn't like making itself easy to understand. One well-known fact about The Legend of Zelda is that the player is directed to use the manual upon starting a new game. Transparency, probably my favorite YouTube channel, made a great video on Tunic which explores these manuals. You should subscribe to them, watch that video when you're done with this one, and play Tunic in that order. In their video, they explore the manual's crucial relationship with The Legend of Zelda, and a key takeaway is that the manual expands our understanding of the boundaries of the game. Elden Ring does not have a manual, or at least not one in the way that Zelda does. But do you know what it does have? Notes from other players. Sure, in previous From Software games, players could leave cutesy little notes for each other, which were often quite useful. But while the system itself is mostly unchanged from these older games, it is absolutely crucial in Elden Ring in a way it wasn't for those older titles. By giving the player this large, cryptic world with many layers, slapping them on the ass and saying, go get them, tiger, Elden Ring invites ruin on those who might need more direction, more help. But instead of flipping through a manual to figure out what to do, FromSoft lets other players help out instead. Yes, many of the signs are jokes or maybe even deliberately misleading, but so many are crucial for making your way through the game. Remember when I found that hole in West Limgrave left by the meteor? The only reason I knew to go down was because of a note left by another player on where to go. These kinds of hints act as a kind of improvised manual, allowing the player to spontaneously generate the game's paratext, rather than force one upon them. If the overworld is the game, not just the physical world needs a map, but the imaginary gameplay needs a map as well. And in both The Legend of Zelda and Elden Ring, paratext, whether delivered from a manual, a friend, a guide, or the helpful scrawls of another player, form a key tool for how the player overcomes the perplexing nature of that world. If we were to critique The Legend of Zelda and Elden Ring's promise that the overworld is the game, the most natural sticking point would be how tedious they become upon repetition. The first time you travel to the northwest corner of the map, each screen in Zelda is a fresh experience. So even if you're running into similar enemies or the aesthetic remains constant, you at least fulfill the sense of exploration Zelda wants you to have. But the second time, the idea of exploration starts to wane. 
And by the tenth time, well, it's just busy work, isn't it? In the year 2022, we have fast travel to mitigate this a bit, but the important tenet that in a game about exploration, you can only explore something once before it becomes mundane remains true for Elden Ring, and perhaps more true than it was ever true for The Legend of Zelda. As a simple piece of introductory evidence, my first run of Elden Ring took 61 hours, my second run took 36, and note, I did a lot more in my second run than I did on my first, and I was like 40 levels higher when I finished. My third run only took 19 hours. If I did a fourth, we'd probably see another precipitous drop in playtime, especially because I did the entire Ronnie side quest in every one of those playthroughs, which is quite grueling. Side note, the first time I did that quest was because she was my favorite character. The second time was because I needed her sword for my int build, and the third time was because I basically needed to complete a quest anyway to complete Fia's quest, which I wanted to do. The reason my playtime dropped so much isn't because the game's challenges became easier, though they obviously did with experience, but because so much of Elden Ring is exploratory filler you'll never want to do more than once if you can help it. Sure, the game has dozens of dungeons, but most aren't worth doing more than once, especially when you realize just how empty the rewards can be. Earning a new Ashes Summon I won't use for the tenth time just doesn't excite me, doesn't inspire me to do the next dungeon. The double-edged sword of a game where the overworld is the game is overworlds can be tedious, contain superfluous content meant to be skipped over. No matter how engaging Elden Ring is, the more it packs into every corner of the world, that just means more stuff you'll only want to do once, or worse, you'll just stop doing because the rewards for doing so cease to be valuable. A continual refrain I used to describe the game to friends in the first few weeks after it was released was that it's five times the amount of level design as Dark Souls, or five times the size of Dark Souls, but only 90% of the quality. A certainly stunning accomplishment, if you ask me, but that last 10% was often what made FromSoft levels memorable worth replaying, and works against one of the greatest strengths of FromSoft games in the jump to an open world experience. Most open world games struggle with how the lack of variety in gameplay and levels breeds flyover content, but more so than other open world games, those with the promise that the world the player explores is the game rather than the game is the missions the player takes in that world, the characters they meet, or their ability to abuse the game's mechanics, or bases they build, or other players that they run into, or mods, or mini games within the world. You see that there's a lot of variety between in open world games. Games where the overworld is the game have their well run dry much quicker, because exploration is finite. It's based on a lack of something. Knowledge. You can't quite play Outer Wilds, Tunic, The Legend of Zelda, Elden Ring, or other games of their ilk a second time and have the same experience, because that primary verb, explore, can only be done once. Not all is lost, and not all in Elden Ring is bad for this decision. Instead, what I mean to highlight here is how FromSoft, in their desire to evoke the core promise of The Legend of Zelda, replicated both the wonders of that promise and its pitfalls. What I find most interesting about the parallels between The Legend of Zelda and Elden Ring is how little the promise changed over the intervening 36 years between them, which speaks to a surprising lack of ingenuity on the part of game designers to promise us something new. But more importantly, just how endearing the groundwork The Legend of Zelda laid is. I suspect in another 36 years, in 2058, we'll still have games trying to figure out new ways of fulfilling the same promise. A world which shifts and opens itself up to the player as they explore, making each new discovery feel as meaningful as possible while remaining as cryptic as possible so as not to spoil future possibilities. I hope by drawing a line between Elden Ring and this now distant past, 
you can see that Elden Ring is more than a 10 out of 10 because it continues gaming culture's development of one of its most sacred and interesting promises for players, fulfilling that promise in a way that's never been done before, while leaving more work to be done as to how game designers can genuinely make the overworld the game. Twenty-six days after Elden Ring released everywhere, the YouTuber Dunky released his Dunk view on it. After a lengthy introduction praising the game's size and variety, he gets to his primary point. It feels like they only spent 10 seconds balancing this game. And that ultimately, it's an incredible game that is held back by very poor balancing. Dunky's video is only 5 minutes in length though. Zooming forward a couple weeks, Joseph Anderson, in a much more thorough critique, gave praise to the game's open world, but echoed a similar complaint to Dunkey's. The fights that were so bad that they marked the end of my interest in this series. Balance is a key component of Anderson's complaints, though the term is not specifically evoked in the video. He notes the game is particularly difficult for him to play as a melee character without any summons, but is trivially easy with other builds or using other tools within the game. In essence, arguing that the game is not balanced for the kind of play he is interested in having. For practically everyone I've talked to about Elden Ring, similar experiences abound. I have one friend who gave up on the game partway through because of it, another who had to completely change builds to get through the last third of the game, and others who felt the game alternates between way too easy and way too hard at the drop of a hat. Of course, this isn't the first time, oh my god it's more like the thousandth time, the topic of difficulty and balance has come up for a FromSoft game. Heck. In my elaborate review of Sekiro, I spent an entire section trying to answer the question, is Sekiro too difficult? You should maybe go watch that video when you're done with this one. It's pretty damn good. Anyway, I spent so many words discussing Sekiro's difficulty because just how difficult the game was seemed to consume a large part of the discourse around the game, and I wanted to intersect ideas of difficulty with expectations, and show just how subjective the idea of difficulty really is. Elden Ring may or may not be too difficult, but the discussion of balance is analogous to Sekiro's renowned difficulty. So let's dive into this cesspool of discourse again. In this section of the video, we're going to consider the following questions. How do we define balance? Is Elden Ring balanced? No. Why do we care about balance, and would Elden Ring be a meaningfully better game if it was balanced differently? Hi, hi kitty. The first step in talking about balance is defining what balance is. Balance is not difficulty. Most people wouldn't say, I want to be the guy, a legendarily difficult Kaizo Modest game is an imbalanced game. If they would, I probably wouldn't want to be friends with them. Perhaps it will be useful or at least boost my viewer engagement, to use a Marvel meme to illustrate my point. The evil villain of the Avengers movies, Thanos, is obsessed with balance. His primary goal is to wipe out half of the life in the universe because of his misguided Malthusian philosophy that will bring balance to nature. He also gives Gamora a knife and says, Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Just like some people make a TV show or superhero movie series their whole personality, Thanos makes balance his. If you'd listen to game critics like Dunkey and Joseph Anderson, you might hear shades of Thanos. But just like difficulty, balance is a subjective experience. It's something a developer can strive for, but never truly attain, because each player's experience will vary. A balance game is not one which feels good to play, is easy, or has manageable challenges, but one in which the world is fair in harmony with itself. For the purposes of this review, 
I define balance as the measure of how internally consistent a game's challenges are. If a game's difficulty is consistent start to finish, with no section standing out as noticeably easier or more difficult than any other, then congratulations, you've made a balanced game. You've probably made a boring one, but you've definitely made something balanced. A note before we get started, Elden Ring is both a single player and multiplayer game. Single player games have a much more varied experience with balance than multiplayer ones. If balance is the measure of how internally consistent a game's challenges are, multiplayer game balance wants to make the challenge each player faces functionally equivalent to provide the illusion of fairness. But single player balance wants to make each designer created challenge contextually appropriate with another. Complicating this, in a game like Elden Ring, changes made in an effort to balance the game's multiplayer content can indirectly impact how enjoyable the single player campaign is and vice versa. For the purposes of this review of the game's balance, I am disjoining these two systems, and I will treat Elden Ring as primarily a single player game. Partially because the multiplayer scene is still developing as I speak this right now, and partially because I've never been that interested in multiplayer combat in Souls games. Sorry. The first hurdle any discussion of balance must cross is to ask just how important is balance anyway? A balanced game isn't necessarily good. And a great game doesn't necessarily have to be balanced. Balance is simply not an end in and of itself. If ludonarrative dissonance is an internal conflict between a game's narrative and gameplay, then we might describe an imbalanced game as having ludo-ludic dissonance, or an internal conflict between the game's gameplay and its gameplay. While bad balance can be a serious hamper on how a game feels to play, most wouldn't say it invalidates an entire game or what it's trying to do. In this sense, Balance is more about quality of life, of quality of expectations, of wanting a game to live in harmony with itself, than it is about the quality of the game. Yet, to hear the donkeys of the world, balance has a fundamental effect on the quality of a game. It can cause one to completely lose excitement in a series, or serve as a glaring flaw in an otherwise perfect gem. Heck, some people's entire job is balancing games. So how do we rectify the difference between more general game design and balance? By diving even deeper into the cultural baggage around balance, of course. The most likely place you hear discussions of balance are not for nominally single player experiences like Elden Ring, but multiplayer games, particularly of the eSport variety. I don't really hear people clamoring for Pictionary to be rebalanced. We can glean a lot about the importance of balance from observing such discussions. As a once legend player in Hearthstone, a platinum player in StarCraft, and a shit player in every other esport I've ever played, though I have played a lot of them, and as someone who has always been interested in design as I'm actually playing these games, I have a long and intimate history of thinking about esports balance. I have seen things you people wouldn't believe. Day one bans in a paper card game, beloved MOBA characters getting the nerf hammer, top tier strategies getting buffs of all things, and yet all these patches are now lost to time like tears in the rain. Therein lies the rub when talking about multiplayer game balance. Where do we draw the line between these games as services, which need to be continually updated to keep the player base engaged and happy, and genuine changes made to improve the balance of the game? Balance keeps a game interesting, gives players more news over long stretches without any updated content for the game. Balancing is never finished. The only real solution to this problem is to ignore the developer and talk about the player, because Balance in a multiplayer game is fundamentally a player experience phenomenon, which informs the social culture around a game. Regardless of the developer's motivation for such balance changes, players almost unilaterally harp on balance for one reason, fairness. While we will first dive into the 
a technical understanding of fairness, I want to foreground this discussion with a simple observation. People harp on balance not because they care about numbers, but because of how they feel about the experience of playing a game. It matters less whether a character does 6 or 8 or 10 damage per hit, and more how it feels to be on the receiving end of that damage. Feelings come first, logic comes second, meaning that a player usually experiences something that feels unfair and then looks at the numbers to come to a conclusion as to what caused that feeling and how to adjust it. Fairness, though, is a nebulous term, and often things get nerfed not because they are strictly good, but because they feel bad to play against. A strategy or character in a multiplayer game may only have a 50% win rate, but if 100% of those games are miserable to play against for the opponent, it's likely that the character will be nerfed or changed. For instance, Techies, a Dota character whose game plan is mostly to lay mines and get surprise kills on players, has a sub 50% win rate in every role. Techies low win rate is a good thing, because Techies is not fun to play against. If he were a viable meta hero, it would potentially discourage players from playing the game altogether. To some degree, Techies' 48% win rate is more fair than if he had a 50% one, which, as strange as it technically sounds, feels emotionally appropriate. Again, this is because fairness is more directly related to how a game feels than its actual stats. Multiplayer games require strict interpretable outcomes, i.e. winners and losers. The goal of balance is to ensure that such outcomes feel earned. In general, we can identify two different kinds of balance changes, targeted and systemic. Targeted balance changes are those that impact one strategy but not others. In essence, they only impact a game where that strategy, character, etc. are employed. So if Ryu's Hadouken is buffed to do 5% more damage, that doesn't matter in a match where Ryu is not present, and primarily impacts only Ryu players. The usual kinds of balance changes we see in games and are clamored for by players are these kinds of targeted changes. These changes are an endless tweaking to a game's systems, a response to how players feel in conjunction with how statistics might back them up. They are usually harmless decisions to make, they move some needles and give the player base a feeling that something is being done, but outside of the highest levels of play, where margins of victory and defeat are much more narrow, these balance changes rarely deeply impact a game or how it feels to play. If a soccer player's big roach rush was winning them games in Silver League, that's probably not going to change much if the roach receives a nerf or a buff, because the skill of the player matters a lot more in the outcome of those games than the power of their units. Still, it is this group, lower level players, that talk about buffs and nerfs the most in my experience, precisely because their lack of understanding about the game, its systems, and what they need to do to win, which contributes to their feeling that the game is unfair. Game developers are in an unenviable position of needing to cater to two groups then, highly skilled players where numbers do matter and impact the outcome of games, and lower skilled players who vastly outnumber the higher level players but experience fairness at completely different clips than the data might suggest, and whose continued involvement is key for monetary success. Elden Ring has the same problem with this difference between highly skilled and lower skilled players. Systemic balance changes, on the other hand, are probably more important than targeted ones to make a game feel good, but often get less attention because they cause less of an emotional reaction in players. In essence, these are changes which impact every game and player in one way or another. While their individual characters or strategies might have different responses to such changes, they fundamentally impact everything. A clear example of this would be StarCraft II's starting worker change. Essentially, in the game's first two major iterations, Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm, players started with six workers, the same as 
Wait, no, it wasn't the same as Brood War. Anyways, we started with six workers to mine minerals and gas. But upon the release of Legacy of the Void, the amount was upped to 12. This change significantly sped up games, because every aspect of StarCraft, from units to production to expansions to technology, are all dependent on the game's internal economy. By tweaking that economy in such a major way, the nature of the game changed, and that had cascading consequences for how it felt to play and watch. These kinds of systemic changes generally come about because of deeper issues with how a game matches, or rather doesn't match, the developer's vision for what the game should be and how the players should play the game in the first place. Generally speaking, the goals of targeted and systemic balance are different. The former are tweaks to a system to make a game feel more fair on a game-by-game -game basis, and the latter tend to be broad changes which change the character of the game and its systems. The distinction between these two kinds of changes is extremely important in our discussion of Elden Ring because we have to ask, what kinds of balance changes are critics calling for? Dunkey argues at multiple points in his video that sliders just need to be moved up and down to make the game a more compelling experience. But Joseph Anderson points to the underlying systems of the game, arguing, for example, that Elden Ring has Sekiro bosses without Sekiro's combat system. To discuss whether or not the game is balanced and why that matters, we have to consider at least a bit whether targeted changes which simply adjust individual challenges within the game are needed or if larger systemic changes would be necessary to fix Elden Ring and its problem of balance. So let's finally get to the actual gameplay of Elden Ring and figure out what would need to be done to rebalance it. Let's divide Elden Ring into three sections, the early game, the mid game, and the late game. The relationship between these three is more of a spectrum than a sharp divide, but I believe an artificial separation can help us suss out why the game feels like an uneven experience. In the early game, the player is plopped right into the game's starting area, Limgrave with only their starting equipment and some magic yellow pixie dust to guide them to their next destination. Limgrave is the player's oyster. They are free to explore it to their heart's content. If they follow the game's suggested path, as displayed by Sites of Grace, they are likely to run into the first major boss of the game, Margit. Margit? 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 I don't know how to say it. Margit is a deliberate pushover, a tough boss meant to gatekeep the player from progressing on from Limgrave too early. It seems pretty obvious that the player is supposed to run into Margit, Realize he's too tough for them right now, and then explore the rest of Limgrave until they are strong enough to take him on. Of course, in my first playthrough, I just unceremoniously banged my head against him for like an hour as a level 7 character until he died. Then I got to level up like 10 times in a row for my troubles. Margaret teaches that in Elden Ring, if the game is suddenly feeling too tough, like enemies are one-shotting you or you aren't doing much damage to them, that you should leave and come back later. Limgrave is clearly designed to accomplish this goal. Heading north, the player can find a field full of deadly giants. Better save them for another time. In the east, they can find the Mistwood Forest, which is filled with giant bears, which are almost unkillable to the early game player. Best to avoid them too. To the far east, they find Kaled, a torturous and miserable place plagued by red skies, dragons, and demonic crow things. The game throws all these nigh impossible foes and mysteries at the player and says come back when you are strong enough. Yet Limgrave is populated with all sorts of more manageable mysteries and challenges. As a result, I suspect most first time players spend the largest portion of their playthrough exploring every nook and cranny of Limgrave. We could describe this as a kind of hands off direction, right? a hands off balance. The player isn't explicitly told don't do this, are barred from going places, but should probably, you know, take the hint. During the game's early section, Elden Ring's balance is certainly an uneven experience for the player, as I just kind of described with the massive bears and shit, but I haven't seen too many people complain about it. Yeah, it's annoying when a giant bear hugs you to death, but the lesson to learn is obvious. Not here, not now. These spikes in difficulty, while indicative of imbalanced gameplay, 
do not seem to cause that ludoludic dissonance. That is, they seem to be congruent with the experience of playing the game and its other challenges. They fit within the player's assumption that this is an RPG, where their player will continue to grow stronger by leveling up, finding new stuff, and upgrading their weapons. I'll go out on a limb here and say that Limgrave appears to be most players' favorite part of Elden Ring. It feels huge and endless, most representing the joy of the original Legend of Zelda's exploration. I believe a large part of this is because Limgrave is laid back in its approach. Some things may be difficult, but the player doesn't need to climb walls at this point. Just go find some shorter wall to climb, you know, come back later. It's after Limgrave and Stormville Castle, the impressive legacy dungeon that bookends the early game, that we start running into some genuine balance problems though not always the ones you'd expect. The lively fields and dark forests of Limgrave give way to the serene Lyurnia, but exploring Lyurnia is not nearly as fluid as Limgrave, and part of this has to do with its more flat design robbing the area of some of its mystery. I believe the problem is more keenly related to the game's balance in the midsection. Balance cuts both ways, and for much of Lyurnia, the problem isn't spikes in difficulty, but spikes downward, or spikes towards easiness. Most of Ionia feels comparable to Limgrave, but by the time the player arrives here, they're no longer the simple knave they were when they started the game. They've learned the ropes, found a rhythm that's appropriate for them. Thus, Ionia feels a bit dumbed down, and the challenge of the game is reduced. The area still provides some fresh new thrills, but the magic of Limgrave starts to fade as the player explores this new area. Each find less impressive than the last, and most new enemies not as imposing as the first time you experience their counterparts in Limgrave. Then you go up to the unassuming Carrion Study Hall, and this bitch just snipes you from across the map, mercilessly killing you over and over while her minions stop you from hitting her because they keep getting in your way. I literally had two friends just give up <laughs> from doing the study hall and never return to it. Or maybe the final boss of the Carrion Academy keeps killing you and the run back and laborious first section of the fight gets you down and you just turn off the game in frustration. Therein lies the rub. Elden Ring is both surprisingly easy until it's surprisingly hard. Large swaths of the game, particularly open world sections where the horse is available, are frankly trivial, meaningless challenges. On replay, the player should probably just skip over them. The problem is further exacerbated as the player moves on from Lyurnia into Lyondell, where a single combo from a boss can often kill their character. But average enemies are felled by their blade in one, maybe two swings. It certainly doesn't help that there's no in-game guide to tell you when you should go through each section, and even online guides that give level recommendations can be inadequate if a player's build isn't appropriate. On my first playthrough, I completed a large swath of Kaelid before I even reached Lyurnia or the Academy. In fact, I got all the way to the end of Redmain Castle, only to be completely stumped by the misbegotten and crucible knight at the end. I even tried to summon other players and be summoned into their worlds, but for like three hours straight, every attempt ended in failure. I later learned I was probably 30 to 40 levels under what would have been appropriate for that fight, which was why my attacks did like 3% of the crucible knight's health. When I returned to Lyurnia, Nearly every challenge before me was trivial compared to what I faced in Kaled. Later on, spurred by Ronnie's quest, I reached the capital through the passage in the deep root depths before I ever even touched the Altus Plateau, which is the intended path. Essentially, I skipped another 20 to 30 levels worth of the game. So what do you think it looked like when I finally stepped onto the plateau, having already completed the capital? It was a bloodbath. Well. 
a boring bloodbath because most enemies posed no challenge and every boss I ran into was trivially easy. I wondered aloud to myself at this point, is this the easiest From game I've ever played? Put a pin in that because it's going to be important in a moment. Then I trekked through the forbidden lands toward the mountaintop of giants and again I found myself suddenly outmatched. My weapon would barely budge the health totals of bosses, and even when I took them out, it was a grind. I reached the top of Castle Soul, but the boss there, Commander Neal, summoned allies to fight with him, and his dumb dweebs could kill me in one combo, so the fight just felt incredibly oppressive. Yet, unlike Limgrave, where I could just go somewhere else when I ran into trouble, I was quickly running out of options. I didn't have anywhere else to go. I felt like the buck stopped. Here, I then saw a friend on Discord mention success they had with the Mimic tier, which I had acquired but never used, not even once, because I just thought it was another random summon. Up until that point, I had been using level 0 ashes from Limgrave, only because the skeletons would reanimate when they died, giving them more time to distract my enemies. Well, I decided I would go and upgrade my Mimic tier and decided to take on Commander Nial again and I won on my first try. It wasn't even particularly close. What happened? Well, I learned that I ignored an entire facet of the intended way to play the game. With my Mimic tier in tow, I plowed through the rest of the game, with no boss causing me much trouble or more than a couple attempts. I completed the game again, feeling that it was probably the easiest From game I've ever played. and. I wasn't using one of the ultra broken builds like Horfrost Stomp or whatever. I just had a simple two-handed great axe and sometimes an ant's head for a shield, which was metal. My first experience with Elden Ring then, like most players, was punctuated by balance or the lack thereof. At various points due to my own incompetence or being severely underleveled, the game was a difficult slog where I had to butt my head against bosses I shouldn't be at until they yielded to my stubborn will. Yet, at other points, the game was so meaninglessly easy that it barely felt like I was making any meaningful decisions. I could just run up to enemies and attack them without considering their strengths or weaknesses or actions because the best option was to just remove them before they could even get going. Today, I have no qualms with just saying outright, Elden Ring is an uneven, unbalanced game. The critics are right. The straw that personally broke the camel's back for me and led to the inspiration for this section was Jacob Geller's long Twitter thread about fighting Melania perhaps the hardest boss in the game, where he wrote, Cool that one boss can just ruin the fucking game. Very cool. Love it. Gellers boiled over frustration, the result of over six hours of attempts and a build swap, which I read right after I thought to myself for the first time, this is the easiest FromSoft game I've ever played, made me see just how terribly imbalanced the game is. If you've completed Elden Ring, I suspect it is likely some of your experience resonates with what I've just described. It certainly does for Dunkey and Joseph Anderson, whose videos have combined for over 5 million views as of the time of when I wrote that. I actually don't know where they're at right now. In order to attempt to fix this problem then, we've got to consider why Elden Ring is like this. I don't believe it comes down to incompetence on the designer's fault like Dunkey claims. Instead, it's the nature of all open world games to struggle with balance. It comes with the territory. It is a systemic problem. While I would hesitate to say it's a feature and not a bug of open world games, to some degree, I don't think imbalanced moments are a box an open world game can simply design itself out of, like Joseph Anderson seems to suggest. The first reason open world games struggle with balance is because they let the player choose the sequence of challenges rather than letting the developer do it for them. If you're familiar with the concept of flow, and you know there's like stupid graphs on the internet that kind of like show you like the challenge should slowly rise while the player is slowly getting better at the game. And the issue is that in an open world game, the player can just rearrange those challenges. So you can't easily make that um, simple flow line and make a game feel balanced. You may be asking, well, isn't the strength of an open world game that the player can choose where to go and what to do? 
And the answer is, yeah, I would totally agree with you. But a player's intuition, no matter how impeccably a game is designed, is not always going to align with what's best for them. Us players are pesky and stubborn and often quite daft. Should I have toiled away at Margit as a level seven character? No way, it was a stupid thing to do, but it was my own dumb decision and I stuck with it because it's what I wanted to do. By opening up the decision on where to go and when, the developer invites the player to feel the joys of freedom, but also the pains of imbalance because they won't always tackle challenges in an appropriate order. I want to be clear, there is no way to both genuinely give the player freedom on where to go and provide an appropriate and congruent challenge for them every step of the way. You can signpost what the player should do every step of the way, but with genuine freedom comes their ability to simply say, that sign can't stop me because I can't read. Even the brightest players will choose not to read your signs, but still developers keep trying to solve this problem because it's a very constant one across the experience of playing open world games. We can't overlook the natural consequences role-playing mechanics in games like this have either. It isn't just that the player might pick a problem in over their head from a skill level, but also one that punches far above or below the character's weight when they get there. Yet this, again, comes with the territory. If a player levels up their character to make them stronger, their decisions will only feel meaningful if, you know, they actually become stronger, and challenges become easier as a consequence of their decisions. Thus, the player character will naturally begin to outscale areas and enemies, consequently removing how consequential their moment-to-moment -moment decisions are. If the first time you fight an enemy in Elden Ring, a single hit from them will stun you or take out a huge chunk of your HP, while it takes you, I don't know, three hits to kill them, but upon a return at a higher level, you can one-shot them, and they can't even stun you anymore. So even if they do manage to land a hit, the damage is negligible. Well, that's the RPG mechanics in action, but it will also feel imbalanced, albeit in a direction favorable to the player rather than against them. It does often feel good to go back and beat up enemies who gave you trouble, but it rarely feels rewarding, and it can be detrimental when the player is experiencing those enemies for the first time and is already overleveled. On the other end of the pitch, it can feel frustrating to run into an enemy you're ill-equipped to deal with. But if you return after strengthening your character, it can feel very rewarding to defeat them specifically because of how much trouble they gave you the first time. Thus, imbalance may be inherent in an open world RPG game, but it doesn't have to be bad or detract from the game if it's well contextualized. Nonetheless, no amount of contextualizing can stop a player from finding themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. There will always be an issue of balance in these games. Perhaps the most common solution to the problem of open game balance is to scale up enemies with the strength of the player. Basically, this means that if a player is level 100, they fight enemies scaled up to give a level 100 character a meaningful challenge. On the face of it, this seems to solve the problem of balance, as it keeps the challenge in line with the relative strength of the player character. But anyone who's experienced these kind of systems have probably found them lacking. I believe the reason for this is twofold. The first reason is player knowledge. Sure, you can scale up an enemy to provide more of a challenge, but oftentimes such systems do not meaningfully scale up the complexity of the challenge. Just give enemies some more hit points and maybe so make them do a little bit more damage. These enemies thus do not surprise the player. The player has already learned how to defeat such foes before, so enemies only improved in invisible ways do not meaningfully change what is asked of the player, but instead just ask them to maybe do the right thing a few extra times. Such problems become more pronounced if the player has developed cheesy habits. Even if an enemy has scaled up, it may be no match for a character with a broken spell that kills everything on sight, or one whose sneak attack is always lethal. The second reason these systems tend to be lackluster is because they generate our new favorite invented feeling for the sake of this video, ludoludic dissonance. 
In case you've already forgotten, ludoludic dissonance is when a game's gameplay is incongruent with itself. If you fought some bandits at, let's say, level 5, and it took you three swings of your sword to kill them, and now you're at level 50, ostensibly 10 times stronger, but it still takes three swings to knock them out, you may well experience dissonance between what you thought you were doing in the game, i.e. leveling up, growing stronger, and what was actually happening. Nothing. At that point, you may begin to disregard leveling up altogether, feeling as though your decisions in the role-playing arena have little weight on the actual play of the game. While some famous open-world games like Skyrim use this kind of level scaling, it isn't exactly in vogue anymore for these reasons, and Elden Ring eschews it entirely. Instead, Miyazaki's team decided it best to just give the player the reins to figure it out themselves. They gave the player the freedom to make the right choice, but also the wrong one. Yet this feels like a pretty unsatisfactory answer. After all, why can't we, as Dunkey puts it, move some sliders around and bing bang, fixed game? Well, as we already discussed, this would be targeted balancing, but my question would be, does lowering the difficulty of some encounters meaningfully make Elden Ring a more interesting or better game? Sure, it might make it slightly less frustrating in specific moments, but for the most part, I don't think the random spikes in difficulty, even in the late game, much hamper players who've already shown a propensity for overcoming challenges by getting that far. What I mean to say is that anyone who has made it to Melania or Malaketh has already overcome challenges just as hard. Sure, the player may get frustrated at the spike in difficulty, but that doesn't inherently mean the game is poorly designed. These characters are gatekeepers after all, or optional. Their frustration is more likely due to not using the game's systems properly, like when I was using level zero summons, or because they are underleveled for the challenge in front of them, or because they've run into a boss who requires a different approach than the one that they're used to, like how some of the bosses in the game are immune to bleed or cold damage. Would Elden Ring's story be meaningfully better if these fights were better balanced? A goal which I again note is practically impossible. Would swinging its weapons feel better if they did 5% more damage? I am highly skeptical that it would. And what of Joseph Anderson's more broad, systemic changes that might fix his frustrations with the game? As he notes, even if they were all fixed, his first play through the game would still be tarnished. That's just how frustrating the game's design left him. But more closely scrutinizing the way Anderson played the game leaves me feeling frustrated. He purposefully avoided using summons, a core component of the game, and used that experience as his baseline for understanding the balance and challenge of the game. I'm all for players playing the way they want to, but it's hard to level against a game bad design when you've functionally removed a huge part of that design due to your own personal preference. He notes that he did eventually play the game with summons and longer ranged magic, which made much of the game's bosses trivial. But I would retort. As someone who has played through the game multiple times, on multiple builds, the game gets much more easy, often to a trivial degree, not because your build changes, but because you've changed. You get to a boss and already know what they're going to do. You already have a game plan to defeat them. So these caveats feel rather muted to me. Instead, I would ask again, would Elden Ring be a meaningfully better game if the player had bigger windows to punish bosses after they do their attacks, or those bosses had less options to extend their combos in surprising manners. I don't think it would. For one, because those windows seem to be a built-in response to complicating the fights once summons are involved, and two, because such changes wouldn't meaningfully change what is good about Elden Ring. It's fantastic map and exploration, it's bombastic tone, the freedom of the player to go where they want and do what they want in this vast land. To some degree, I feel like the level of scrutiny Joseph Anderson and Dunkey place in the game's difficulty and balance to be a misguided result of reviewer brain. Oh look, a second transparency reference in this video. Seriously, 
go subscribe to them. I don't mean to minimize their experiences because I view them as genuine responses to their time spent playing the game. I don't doubt for a second Anderson's sincerity in calling Elden Ring a shattered masterpiece, and I might agree with him, but rather than viewing the game's flaws and balances as natural extensions of its various strengths, like I've tried to lay out here, both Anderson and Dunkey try to solve for what Elden Ring is not. It's not a game where you're supposed to try to solo each boss. You can do it, the game gives you the freedom to make that choice, but it's clearly not what you're supposed to do. Similarly, the game is clearly built for some bosses to punish you with death if you get hit by their combo. Even if that combo feels unfair or frustrating, lowering the damage or doing targeted balancing to make these fights less frustrating wouldn't really change what the game's about, how it communicates that to the player, or even necessarily how difficult the game ends up being. It would just make some of the late game bosses a little bit easier. To some degree, I feel like these reviewers, and many other voices I've heard echoing similar complaints, want what Elden Ring can't give them, to have a nice, rounded, well-balanced experience from start to finish, and to have it their own way. But that's the rub. Your way will sometimes lead to hardship. In order to make decisions meaningful, some need to make the game more difficult than others. So please, have it your way. Follow your arrow rather than the games. But perhaps don't conclude that Elden Ring is broken because you chose the path less traveled. Instead, maybe enjoy that you took the path you did and find the value that can be gleaned from it. Two things as we wrap this section up. First, I don't want you to get the impression that my goal is to just drag other video creators. In fact, I'm incredibly thankful that they made these inferences because they helped calcify something I wanted to say in contrast. As I've noted, many have made similar remarks. I just singled out these two voices because they are distinct and helped clarify for me the difference between targeted and systemic balance changes. Second, I genuinely love Anderson's observation that the game is a shattered masterpiece, because it harkens back to why I find Elden Ring so interesting. As we will get to in part 4, Elden Ring is not a 10 out of 10, and perhaps the game's imbalance is part of that, but more importantly, the fact that Elden Ring inspires this conversation in the first place and makes me want to think about balance big and small, make up new words to describe game design like ludo-ludic dissonance, that may not make it perfect but it certainly makes it more than just a score on a spreadsheet. And that's what keeps me coming back to this game. But I'm still hooked on something. That Mimic tier, the one that helped me out of my late game jam. It's not just a crutch that got me through some rough times. I think it might be the most interesting thing Elden Ring has to offer. Approximately halfway through Elden Ring, depending on who you ask, the Chosen Tarnished travels to the eternal city of Nokron through a massive hole in the earth carved out by a meteor. We've already talked about it a little bit. Between the crater and their destination lies perhaps the game's most interesting boss, and certainly the game's most interesting companion, the Mimic Tear. Entering this foe's lair, the player approaches a silver puddle on the floor, which then rises up to take the shape of not some belligerent demigod, stalwart knight, or disgusting monstrosity, but of the player themselves, their exact shape, armor, weapons, and spells. After a fight, presuming the player is victorious, the mimic tear then dissipates in the same way it mysteriously came allowing the player to continue forth on their quest. Though, a little ways into the city, the player finds a chest containing the Mimic's ashes, allowing them to summon a copy of themselves in future engagements, doubling their strength with the most simple of multiplication, 
Video games seem to have an obsession with doppelgangers. We can find them in AAA games like Metal Gear Solid, where Snake has a bunch of clones, and indie games like Celeste, where the lead character battles a mirrored psychological representation of herself. As we've continued season one of elaborate reviews, we've encountered a variety of such doppelgangers like Andy's clone in Advance Wars, and Omori and Sunny from Omori. In fact, when it's all said and done, doppelgangers will be this season's subtitle and its general theme. While this is not the last video of season 1, and thus we will save our complete memorializing and reflective discussion on doppelgangers for then, in this section we are going to dive deep into the meaning of the Mimic Tear, because I believe this humble foe and ally rests at Elden Ring's thematic nexus point. It's a substitute for a multiplayer companion, a relief from the series' terrible loneliness, a metaphorical representation of the player's struggles with failure, and of course, a literal representation of the player themselves. The Mimic Tier, or really the player character themselves, the Mimic Tier is a kind of key to understanding what Elden Ring wants to convey to its audience, and a sign that FromSoft is truly trying to move on from some of the previous discourse around its games. As a boss, the Mimic Tier is not terribly unique. Even within From Software's own recent history, we can find a parallel example, that being Dark Souls 2's Looking Glass Knight. Rather than summoning a copy of the player though, the Looking Glass Knight summons NPCs and players from other worlds, which flips the script on the traditional Dark Souls mechanic of the player being the one who summons other players to help them defeat bosses. In this sense, the player almost becomes the boss. We are supposed to read the Looking Glass Knight as a kind of summoner of mimics or of reflections, because his shield is a dark mirror from which enemies spawn. While these enemies may look different than the player, they are meant to be read as similar in purpose, particularly those human foes who come through the portal because they both share the same disposition toward the game world as the bearer of the curse or main character of Dark Souls, and ludically as the player of the game. In either case, they are above the content of the game, but the Looking Glass Knight by forcing conflict between like entities to advance the game's story, brings them down to the same level as the rest of the characters in the game's narrative, if only for a moment. If the Looking Glass Knight was from soft dabbling in clones and doppelgangers for the first time, well probably not the first time, but you get what I mean, the Mimic Tier is their second, more robust, more fully realized attempt, and boy howdy does it succeed in being memorable. We can go back even further to a series we've already spent quite a bit of time on and find another potent doppelganger boss, The Legend of Zelda's Dark Link. For the purposes of time, we're going to focus on Ocarina of Time's version of the character, which is the most reminiscent of the Mimic Tier. In a game full of memorable moments, few stand out from at least my first play through the game as a child as Dark Link, who is just the Water Temple's mini-boss. Not only is Dark Link one of the harder bosses, able to deflect Link's attacks and lacking any easily exploitable weaknesses, at least by Zelda standards, but his entrance and arena are fairly unique. The doppelganger rests against a tree in the middle of an endless shallow lake, just waiting for the player to show up. I wonder, is it genuinely Dark Link or like the Mimic Tier? Would anyone who enters this room find a duplicate of themselves to fight? After all, it is the Water Temple, the shape of fluidity and change. Regardless of the answer, Dark Link and the Mimic Tier both point to the divide between the player and player character, and asks, are the two truly that different? The only real difference between Link and Dark Link is who controls them, no? The same is true for the Chosen Tarnished and the Mimic Tier. For a video game character to fight their shadow, the player must be elevated above the program, given a special place from which to understand the exact difference they impose upon the game world. And yet, these shadows also point back toward the player, their flaws, their impulses, things they might wish to hide from themselves. 
Connecting Ocarina of Time and Elden Ring are these shadows. But whereas the Zelda game only offers a destructive conflict between Link and his shadow, Elden Ring offers the potent ability to befriend the doppelganger. The Jungian concept of shadow can help illuminate the purpose and meaning of these doppelgangers. Though, I do want to make something abundantly clear before we get too deep into the weeds. This kind of structural, analytical psychology, whether Jungian, Freudian, Lacanian, or whatever, is pretty much bunk. The shadow is not a literal thing that exists in your brain. It's as real as your horoscope, or dare I say it, your Myers-Briggs test results. Practicing psychologists and studies have pretty much proven these kinds of personality templates false and misleading. That said, at times they can help us understand media, which are not based in reality, but reflections of how their authors see the world. Heck, those authors may have picked up some of this pop psychology while creating their games, or meant to insert it into them. In a strange way, media themselves are a kind of mirror, a kind of doppelganger of real life. They are reflective and representative, but in a way with more fidelity to how we think of ourselves rather than what we actually are. Jung presents the shadow as a dark underbelly that rests beyond a person's ego, either their unconscious thoughts and actions or just those they do not identify with themselves. So for instance, I don't consider myself to be a particularly envious person. Um, not being envious then is part of my self-conception of myself, and yet at times, like all people, envy does well up within me. In those moments, the feeling is strange and foreign, not because it's not coming from me, quite the opposite, because I do not want to recognize that it is part of me at all. The shadow is what you would reject or hide from yourself in order to keep moving forward every day. When a video game like Elden Ring presents the player character with an exact duplicate of themselves, both to fight and to fight alongside, it's hard not to see the Jungian shadow in our strange mirror friend. While Elden Ring contains all manner of ashes to summon and fight with, in my experience, none were as effective or useful in combating the game's intentional loneliness as the Mimic tier. The player can meet and befriend characters like in previous FromSoft games, but like those predecessors, a prevailing sense of loneliness mars the lands between. The player travels to and fro a variety of places, but unlike other open world games where one might expect to find loads of non-player characters or encampments and towns, heck, even Minecraft has villagers, yet in Elden Ring, no such communities exist to offer the player reprieve from the murderous and dangerous world that surrounds them. Incidentally, the same is true for the original Legend of Zelda, if you were dying to learn even more similarities between the tone of both games. Because Elden Ring is so much larger than a game like Dark Souls or Sekiro, yet has what feels like the same amount of non-player characters in its spaces, I felt uniquely lonely while playing the game. Even the characters you can talk to are reserved and don't have much to say. Heartfelt moments are few and far between, and understanding who these characters are and their motivations usually requires either a lot of intentional questing and digging, or some good YouTube videos. So while the player is on this grand quest to save the realm and restore the Elden Ring, they've got to go it alone, despite Melina's assistance. My initial Spirit Ash summon of choice did it nothing to combat this loneliness either, as I used skeletal warriors because I thought it was rad they could die and then pop up and continue distracting bosses for me. It's safe to say they had no personality. The only remedy for the game's loneliness eventually came not in some Solaire-esque hero whose positive can-do attitude lifted my spirits, but in the redemption of a form of foe, the Mimic Tear. The Mimic Tear did not just give me a major boost in damage or power, though it certainly did give me those things, it gave me a relationship to consider. Across my playthroughs, I always considered my own build relative to how it would impact my Mimic. I knew if I had spells equipped, my Mimic Tear would be tempted to cast them, so I made sure to only equip those spells and abilities that wouldn't distract the Mimic Tear from its combat duties. 
Similarly, I switched my weapon to accommodate the added bonus of a doppelganger, first moving toward poison and cold weapons before settling in on the all-powerful bleed status effect, knowing I could proc it twice as fast with my mimic in tow. My addiction to fashion souls became even more pronounced, as now I wasn't just dressing myself, but dressing up my twin. And how could I not have us both look as cool as possible? Beyond just clothes, I became reluctant to equip talismans that increased the amount of damage I took from attacks, because I didn't want my doppelganger in harm's way. With the other summons, the player may certainly get their mana's worth in combat prowess, but the pair are not a genuine team. They have no genuine relationship with each other. They're just going about doing their own thing. But with the Mimic tier, the player has to actively consider how their own decisions will impact the shape their Mimic tier takes, functionally making the RPG part of this action RPG a little bit more cooperative than it was before. Just as the Looking Glass Knight pitted the player against a shadow of themselves, another person with the same abilities as themselves, the Mimic tier, more so than the game's other Spirit Ashes, gives the player a companion with the same abilities as themselves. Obviously in the most literal sense, but also in a more figurative sense. The Mimic tier is the only Spirit Ash that literally occupies the same space as the player. It can drink Estus Flasks, cast all the spells, use Ashes of War. Thus, while all Spirit Ashes function to alleviate the burden of the game's boss fights with the addition of a companion, it is the Mimic tier that most directly feels like another player has been summoned, not just the spirit of some random NPC enemy you felled 15 dungeons ago. Throughout the Dark Souls games and Elden Ring, other players offer the most poignant form of reprieve from loneliness, and yet, the mechanics of summoning an invasion are scaled back ever so slightly in Elden Ring. A player can reasonably go through the entire game without ever being invaded by another player. And with the advent of Spirit Ashes like the Mimic tier, procuring the aid of other players feels less necessary for overcoming difficult obstacles. I'm not saying the game has fewer multiplayer mechanics, on the contrary, it might implement them the best of any FromSoft game, but at no point do they feel as ingrained in the natural experience of the game as in previous titles, where multiplayer was an incidental thing that had to happen. The Mimic tier, as a fellow player character like, makes up for this and ensures the player has an interesting companion they can relate to, someone who is just like me, for real. Unlike any other Spirit Ash in the game, the Mimic tier requires the player's health as sacrifice rather than their mana. From a functional standpoint, this ensures that any player character with the requisite HP can summon the tier, whereas other Spirit Ashes with high mana costs may be impossible to summon for characters who have not put any of their attribute points into upgrading their mana pool. From a thematic standpoint, it makes complete sense. To summon the Mimic tier, the player character must give of their own blood, their own self. This copy, requiring most of the Tarnist's health bar, physically taxes their resources, because unlike the other Spirit Ashes, it is not a ghost. It is flesh and blood, just like the player character. By paying the Mimic Tears of Blood tax, the player affirms that they themselves are a phantom, and the Mimic Tear itself is more than just another phantom, but an equal of sorts, not just a lowly servant. The Mimic Tears item description reaffirms this when it explains its mimicry does not extend to imitating the summoner's will. We'll round back to that idea of will and identity in a moment because it poignantly reminds us of the Jungian shadow the Mimic Tear represents, but for the moment let's shelve that and discuss the Mimic Tear's impact on gameplay. A few weeks after the game released, those video essayist spurning folks at FromSoft had the gall to rebalance the Mimic Tear, reducing its damage, thus making this point a little less interesting. But rewind the clock to release week for me so that I can answer a rather pertinent and interesting question. Who is stronger, the Mimic Tear or the player? 
character. At a glance, the vast majority of players might quickly assume the answer is themselves. After all, they have access to a whole arsenal of items. Their attacks do slightly more damage, and they have more Estus flasks to continue healing themselves. But consider for a moment an intractable truth. The Mimic tier has way more health than the player does. In traditional Souls games, the player's functional health, that being their total health plus all that could be healed using their refillable healing items, rarely lines up with their practical health, that being how much of their health bar they actually used. For instance, if a boss can one-shot you because your maximum HP is 1000 and he does 1200, then it doesn't matter if your functional HP was 5,000 with healing items considered because the boss could just knock you on your ass all the same. The Mimic tier, meanwhile, has 5 to 6 times the player's total HP and can use a flask to get most of that back. Thus, compared to the player, the idiot can just tank hit after hit and keep fighting. Ultimately, if you were to ask me, when summoned, which of these two characters I'd rather control from just a purely strength perspective, not necessarily a fun one, the answer would have to be the Mimic tier. Also, just to note, the Mimic tier also seems to have like endless mana, which would be great for spellcasters. Fundamentally, its massive pool of health breaks the natural back and forth of FromSoft games by allowing nearly unlimited aggression from the character. In those rare moments, the Mimic tier seems to understand its power fully and starts just wailing on enemies, it's lights out. Almost any boss will just be immediately felled. Successful fights with the Mimic tier invariably use its massive health pool as an advantage, as it gives the player time to heal themselves up and get lots of attacks in while the boss targets their best friend. One of my personal favorite moments with my Mimic tier was during my successful win over Melania. Me and her got the terribly difficult boss to its second form, which begins with a massive attack and a prolonged moment where she just stands still, but she can't get close because of the Scarlet Rod. I hit Melania with the old Ronnie's Dark Moon to reduce her magic resistance and then roared up the powerful Comet Azure to do massive damage. As I did this, I noticed an equally powerful ray of energy burst forth from the other side of the arena. My mimic had copied my strategy, and together, like Goku and Gohan defeating Cell, we blew Melania away, one-shotting her entire second phase. So, as you may be able to guess, the mimic tier is functionally more powerful than the player especially when it decides to use its abilities in an optimal way. Thus, perhaps its greatest contribution to Elden Ring is simply making the game easier, much to the chagrin of longtime Toxic fans who root their identity in beating the notoriously difficult FromSoft games and spend way too much time on the internet arguing about why an easy mode would go against the entire spirit of Dark Souls. And it's true. As we previously noted in the previous section, the summons not only make the game easier, but it's clear many of the game's fights were designed and balanced with the assumption that the player would use Spirit Ashes, like the Mimic tier. In fact, some of Joseph Anderson's complaints can, in part, be boiled down to the game being too difficult without summons and too easy with them. Yet the way that the Mimic tier and the Spirit Ashes make the game easier is spiritually consistent with the history of FromSoft games. It's just that this time, rather than another player coming to your aid, it's a non-player friend. While I get that playing and beating FromSoft games all on your lonesome is a rewarding and fun experience, the inclusion of the Mimic Tier and Spirit Ashes forces us to look back on the other games and ask, is this how they were always meant to be played? And surprisingly, I really think the answer is yes. The kind of cooperative multiplayer Demon Souls in all the Miyazaki games that came after it has is probably the most unique thing about them. I remember the first time I encountered a summon sign in Dark Souls being astounded. You can just like summon another player to help you beat the bosses? That's awesome! Despite being ostensibly single player experiences, a massive amount of energy, ingenuity, effort, and time went into including multiplayer in the Dark Souls games. Its inclusion also answers other oddities of the franchise. You can't pause the game because there is multiplayer, and I assume a pause button would wreck online functionality. If you think 
You can't pause these games because it somehow makes them harder. I've got a bridge to sell you. I mean, come on. All the effort to add multiplayer to FromSoft games is intentional and thus speaks to how they are meant to be played. Thus, when Speared Ashes come along and reaffirm the purpose of multiplayer in these games as the intended experience by allowing it in solitary play, it functionally dismantles the would-be get good bros who would invalidate other players' experiences because they used summons. Maybe these games weren't meant to be so difficult. It's just that you're over there so busy making it more difficult on yourself so that you can lot it over other people as the real way of playing the game and thus you fail to realize that these games were always meant to be played with other people to reduce the loneliness of their worlds so that the load could be lightened on the player. So. Let's consider for a moment how the Mimic tier lightens the player's load. While the damage output and massive health pool are nice, these are actually not the most valuable thing a Spirit Ash brings to the table. That would instead be their ability to hold an enemy's attention. In a traditional Souls boss fight, particularly a 1v1, attention is all consuming. The boss will attack you every chance they get and never let up. The Dark Souls combat formula places a heavy emphasis on defensive moves, whether they take the form of roll dodging, holding up a shield, or keeping your distance and casting spells, or parrying. In order to succeed, the player needs to buy their time for openings rather than just attack and create opportunities naturally. With an ally in tow though, the player mostly needs to play defensive only when a boss turns their attention towards them. When it is fixed on a summon, the player is free to go on the offense. These offensive opportunities then shorten the amount of time the fight takes because the boss's health drops faster, and in turn the player has more room for error in their play, as less time also means fewer opportunities to mess up in a catastrophic way. In this sense, a summon like the Mimic tier makes the game easier, and yet I am completely unsatisfied with the arrangement of pieces because really, the summons are a core aspect of the game. They're meant to be used. The Mimic tier is a core feature of the game, one which reinforces the game's themes and is meant to be used by the player. So rather than describing the summons as making the game easier, implying that the nascent mode of play is forging on without them, we should probably say that not using summons makes the game harder. Right? It is absolutely insane to me that someone would argue against this. But if this video game is an attraction, you can bet your ass people in the comments will try. You can make any game harder by placing arbitrary restrictions on the player. Go beat The Legend of Zelda without picking up heart containers, Super Mario without picking up the fire flower, or Pokemon without evolving your pocket monsters. These can be fun challenges, and I am not going to disparage the way people want to play, but fundamentally, you are neglecting the game's intentional design to play your own way. Kind of reminiscent of our balance conversation. To then turn around and imply that using them, the inbuilt game mechanics, is cheap or undermines the designer's intent is extremely wonky logic, considering the designers, while not omnipotent gods, certainly designed the game with these components in mind. So geez, just use them and enjoy the game. Just as summons are meant to be used from a gameplay perspective, they carry thematic weight in the narrative of Elden Ring. Before we move specifically to the Mimic tier, I want to cover spirits more generally. Plenty of evidence in the game suggests spirit ashes are an extension of one of the core problems plaguing the lands between. The dead don't die. Those who live in death are those who the Earth Tree will not or cannot absorb back into itself. These beings are despised by the Golden Order, who hunt those inflicted with death root. Yet, it appears the Spirit Ashes are an extension of those who live in death. So every time you summon one, you're not just getting a buddy to help you out, but you're interacting with the core themes of the game, that being perpetual undeath. Some of the game's more heartfelt moments, like when you reunite the jellyfish you get early on with its family, or when you help Latena reincarnate her clan, are the results of summoning spirits and helping them fulfill their purpose in the world, not just assuming that they're there to fulfill your purpose. 
Despite their victimization from the Golden Order, those who live in death seem to have just as much a claim on the land as anyone else. And indeed, the Duskborn ending vindicates them. By placing a core mechanic within the lore of those who live in death, Elden Ring forces the player to consider the game's weightier themes of whether or not such ghosts should exist in the first place, and which side do they want to take. You may be wondering, what's the difference between the player character, a Tarnished, who is also seemingly an undead immortal, and those who live in death? Ostensibly, it's that the player character can see grace, which guides them toward the will of the Golden Order, thus absolving them of the sin of the Erd Tree not absorbing their souls when they die. The Mimic Tear acts as a foil to this reading though, because it offers the player a glimpse of what it would look like if they lost their ability to see grace, and the results are not so different. The Mimic Tear can pretty much do everything the player can do, and as we've already noted, the primary difference between them is not ability or looks, but the fact that one is controlled by the player and another by an artificial intelligence. Heck, even their purposes are aligned, as the Mimic Tear's item description specifically says that it was made as an attempt to forge a lord, presumably an Elden Lord like the player is seeking to become. And the player's goal is to become the Elden Lord. No matter which way you slice it, the Mimic Tear and the player character swim in the same water of meaning. They are aligned in purpose, ability, and spiritual status as immortal, reaffirming that the Mimic Tear is indeed the player character's shadow. To better understand the importance of mimics, shadows, and doppelgangers, let's turn to a famous film with not one, but two depictions of them, Christopher Nolan's The Prestige. While the film is supposedly about magic, if you pay attention, you may notice it's actually about doubles. It presents us with two different models for understanding the relationship between such pairings. And from those models, we can extrapolate two wildly different readings of the Mimic Tear. From there, I'll let you decide which you think is more valid. First though, a quick crash course as to what the hell I'm talking about if you haven't seen The Prestige. I guess, spoilers. But the film is like 15 years old. If you were gonna go see it, you should have seen it by now. The central conflict of The Prestige revolves around two rival magicians, Robert the Great Danton, played by Hugh Jackman, and Alfred the Professor, played by Christian Bale. After a falling out, when an accident kills Robert's wife, the two become rivals and continually sabotage each other's magicking operations. Alfred's signature trick is the transporting man, where he enters one door and pops out another like nothing even happened. No one can figure out how he does the trick. Robert, desiring to genuinely copy it with something greater, not just using a body double, travels to America and prods Nikola Tesla to make a machine that can teleport him around. But instead of teleporting people, the machine creates a clone of them a distance away. Robert uses the machine to kill one version of himself and frame Alfred. He then becomes famous with his teleporting man trick, but the morbid reality is that each night when he performs the trick, Robert kills and replaces himself. Alfred, though, gets his revenge, as it's revealed that his transporting man trick was done with an identical twin, and the pair chose to live one life rather than two. The one not in prison destroys the theater and the infinitude of dead Roberts, and the film ends. So, as I foreshadowed, we've got two different versions of the doppelganger on display here, both surprisingly relevant for our discussion of the Mimic Tear. In one, we've got an infinite supply of allies to help us perform the magic trick of beating bosses. In the other, we've got a faithful, lifelong companion with whom we share the spoils of success and the thorns of defeat, who is inseparable from us as player. We occupy the exact same space. It's easy to read the former into the game, even the bit about cloning and the original dying. After all, we sacrifice our own blood in the form of health to summon the Mimic Tear. Who's to say which is the original and copy 
Once both are on the battlefield, and as often the case, you may die while the Mimic Tier lives on fighting. In this version of events, every time we summon the Mimic Tier, we lose a bit of ourselves, grow more hollow as we subdivide our essence. We then understand the Mimic Tier not as some psychological shadow representative of our impulses, but a kind of parasite, one who saps our energy and life force in return for its efforts in helping us overcome obstacles. Just like how Robert uses the cloning machine to become the greatest magician in the land. But in Alfred, we find a different, more wholesome reading of the Mimic Tear. Rather than a parasitic shadow which copies and drains us, the Mimic Tear is the other side of the coin. A necessary part of our being. One which does not seek to exactly replicate us, but complement us. If you haven't guessed it by now, this is my preferred reading of the character. You see, I can't help but feel like the Mimic Tear completes Elden Ring and casts a long shadow over the rest of the Souls series. In these humble ashes, we find a companion with whom we can fight back against the despair and loneliness of these worlds, with whom we can overcome obstacles which hitherto might have been too difficult, with whom we can better understand what it means to go hollow, that terrible affliction that besets many a character in the soul's universe. It does not mean, as the term suggests, to lose oneself or meaning, but instead to find new meaning. In the case of the Mimic Tear, its original purpose to become a lord is dashed. It now lives to aid the player in their quest to become the Elden Lord. Every great hero needs a sidekick, right? One who shores up their weaknesses, has their back. Sonic and Tails, Batman and Robin, Holmes and Watson, Mario and Luigi. In Elden Ring, that companion is the Mimic Tear, and to play the game without it is to reject the potent symbolism the character embodies. So, while we are introduced to the Mimic Tear as a foe to vanquish, not unlike many might approach their own Jungian shadows, it is only in reconciling with that shadow and fusing with it that the player character can reject the loneliness of the lands between. My only complaint would be, why the heck did you put the Mimic Tear behind a stone sword key door from Soft? You should have just given it to the player after they beat the Mimic Tear boss. Oh well. I hope this long discussion of the Mimic Tear has shown you that even in a single item, a single character, one can even easily miss. Elden Ring bakes into its narrative loads of thematic, psychological, and symbolic meaning to uncover and discuss and consider. And surely, that makes it more interesting than just a 10 out of 10, which we'll spend the next section talking about. Elden Ring has a 96 out of 100 on Metacritic. Therefore, it is not a 10 out of 10. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. In all seriousness, Elden Ring is one of the most critically acclaimed games to come out in years. It's a shoo-in for most Game of the Year awards, the king of the hill as far as open world games are concerned, and already considered to be a modern classic by most. While some nitpicking and criticism abound, as for anything this beloved, far and wide praise for FromSoft's latest title can be found. It's not even a conservative thought at this time to imagine Elden Ring will have pretty significant consequences for the rest of the gaming industry. Whether or not it will eclipse Dark Souls' critical legacy remains to be seen, but Elden Ring is from a gravitational standpoint, the biggest FromSoft game since Miyazaki's cult classic left its mark. Beyond just a critical darling, Elden Ring is a commercial juggernaut, tripling FromSoft's humble projection of 4 million sales and launching it into the stratosphere of comparable AAA classics like Breath of the Wild and Red Dead Redemption 2. Simply put, Elden Ring is having a moment. You may think that a section titled Elden Ring is not a 10 out of 10 would seek to mute that moment, perhaps rain on its parade, illuminate every blemish imaginable, but you'd be mistaken. It's not that Elden Ring is less than a 10 out of 10, it's that Elden Ring is more than that number, 
more interesting than immaculate, more exciting than perfect. Elden Ring is flawed and messy in the most intriguing ways, as I've tried to show so far. And yet, when reduced down to a number on a chart, even one as illustrious as a 10 out of 10, an average score of 96 per Metacritic, or just impossibly large sales numbers, I feel the game is stripped of some of its magic, some of its allure. Moreover, massive critical acclaim throwing around synonyms for perfect communicates to an audience that Elden Ring is a must-play game, that it's for everyone. But anyone who has played a FromSoft release since Dark Souls should know that this isn't the case. Elden Ring is actually kind of a niche game. Sure, it's amazing and interesting, but it's a deliberately inaccessible experience on a variety of fronts, meant to appeal to a certain kind of player. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but is that reality reflected in its Metacritic score? No. Just play this game. It's better than the other games you could be playing because its number is higher. Do we live in an age where any game could be for everyone, except Stardew Valley? Is any game must play? Surely not all games are necessary. After all, we're at the point where no one can reasonably play every game coming out. But we live in a time of profoundly fractured media experiences, where I, someone who plays and writes about games both for this channel and academically, have only played four of the eight Game Awards Game of the Year winners, and only 26 of the 44 games nominated since the presumably most prestigious video game awards show debuted. These are supposedly the most important games of the last eight years, or at least somewhat reflective of what the industry and critics think are. And yet, I haven't played God of War or Death Stranding, though I do at least own the latter. I suspect you too have not played a lot of games, and deciding what game to play next is kind of a game in and of itself. At this intersection, we find video game reviews and services like Metacritic, which are meant to guide both your attention and wallets towards the most productive possibilities. Reviews are fun to read and write, and serve a valuable purpose in separating the wheat from the chaff, but as the preeminent way of video games are discussed, they leave much to be desired. If Elden Ring, Ocarina of Time, Super Mario Galaxy, and Tetris are all 10 out of 10s, then the turn of phrase, however attention-grabbing, tells us nothing interesting about the games in question. So, when I say Elden Ring is not a 10 out of 10, my aim lies not on 2022's Critical Darling, but those doing the bestowing, because, well, review scores are kind of stupid. It's important before we get any further into the weeds to distinguish between the review and the review score. If you are just looking at Metacritic, the two are practically interchangeable, but one is a numerical estimation accompanying a product evaluation, the other a genre of writing which critically considers a particular work. A review does not need to be a conclusive qualitative evaluation. Heck, this video is an elaborate review of Elden Ring after all. If I meant to say all reviews are dumb, it would make me look pretty foolish, wouldn't it? While you won't be getting a number at the end of this review, if you scour the internet for discussions relating to Elden Ring, there are plenty of numbers you can find. You can start with the 79 cited on Metacritic. In short, I believe the review serves an important purpose. It's necessary for a complete media culture, but the review score, whether bestowed by an individual or aggregated from hundreds or thousands, does not tell their reader anything meaningful about the media in question. In theory, the review score serves the purpose of placing the quality of a piece of art in context with other works. If a reviewer gives one film three stars and another film four, then comparatively, the reader is meant to assume the latter is superior. If you could then find a reviewer with tastes that exactly match your own, then reading their review scores would be like previewing every film before you watch it, weeding out the ones you won't enjoy, ensuring you catch the ones you will. Unfortunately, no reviewer's tastes will match your own, and in fact, that's probably not even desirable, as then their reviews would lose relevance for everyone else. Instead, we tend to expect the professional reviewer to have better and more refined tastes from our own. 
They'll play every game so you don't have to. Importantly, they must also be able to communicate well what their tastes decide, hopefully beyond just giving the right number. While taste plays a huge role in how we come to understand a singular reviewer, it is almost completely absent once we start aggregating all review scores together. Systems like Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic assume there is some greater truth, some spiritual quality which can be numerically assessed by forcing everyone's tastes together into one big melting pot, reducing any given work of art down to a single important number. We, as a society, love these monolithic numbers. While I doubt any sane person literally views them as the bible of quality, they have significant influence over what many will choose to watch, play, or skip, serve to bolster arguments for or against the quality of various media, and often frame the windows of discussion around a piece of media like a film or a game. To the latter point, have you ever had to take up a defensive tone in either attacking or defending a film because your opinion disagreed with the ambiguous majority as represented by its Rotten Tomatoes score? I am no stranger to these scores either. When I want to go to the movie theater, I have instinctively checked the Rotten Tomatoes scores of the showings since I was like in high school. And since I'm old, that's like 15 years ago. If you're debating with your spouse or friends on what to go see, pointing to the fact that one is certified fresh and the other certifiably isn't is a pretty good way to convince them to see your chosen flick. And considering how painful such discussions can sometimes become, perhaps the reprieve is welcome. Yet, these numbers are depersonalized and decontextualized from their original sources, and frankly, they make less and less sense the further they get from them. For Rotten Tomatoes, a movie with all middling, but ultimately kind of positive reviews might get a 100% score, while another more divisive film, with two thirds of the critics praising it as perfect, but another third describing it as terrible, would be summarily dismissed as rotten. So can you genuinely trust the number you get from them? To genuinely understand what a 3 out of 5 means requires the context of how a publication does review scores, who the reviewer is, the genre and medium of the art being reviewed, and perhaps most importantly, the general culture around reviews of the thing being reviewed. Some genuine product reviewers out there will flat out never give anything a 10 out of 10 because perfection is unachievable. Yet, some film critics will give most any competent children's movie a perfect score. In film criticism, a 3 out of 5 is a nice way of saying a movie is mid for most, but in games criticism, a comparable 6 out of 10 means a game is truly terrible. Since our focus is on games, we can at least try to boil it down and consider these scores a bit more in our native context, but the picture isn't going to get much better than this. Perhaps it's best to start then from the beginning. The video game review is the standard by which games have been discussed since people started discussing games. I went and looked at the earliest issues of Play Meter generally considered the first video game magazine, and even they numerically assigned values to various arcade games. And they weren't even like a consumer rag, but a trade publication, i.e. for people who put jukeboxes and arcade games in their arcade bar or whatever. But you don't need to do a deep dive into the historical record to get that the video game review is the most dominant form of games discourse. In the 80s and 90s, the primary medium of public-facing games discussion was magazines, which, unlike Playmeter, found an audience with players. These mini-volumes contained all sorts of writings. They might preview games yet to be released, give tips, hints, and cheat codes for games already out, and of course, provide qualitative product assessments of the latest releases. While these reviews are not the Pac-Man is the most played game in our survey of 100 arcades, so it gets a 59 out of 60, like in Playmeter, their disposition towards the game is not as a piece of art, but as a product to be consumed by the user. The distinction between art review 
and product review is one of the most difficult things to parse when discussing video games. It's a proverbial fork in the road, because it hardly seems like we can agree on what a game is in the first place. Is it a product you consume, deserving of an objective evaluation, or is it a piece of art, deserving a more holistic attempt to discern not if it is worth the money, but if it has something unique to say? I'd be remiss to not note that I myself spent years writing reviews for a relatively popular video game rag myself, Pop Matters. I gave Dark Souls 2 a 10 out of 10, and my editor, a college professor mind you, was not particularly pleased and he tried to dissuade me from giving it that score, which really just dissuaded me from ever giving a game such a high score again. Ironically though, the entire point that was hammered into us from the editor in general was that we were not doing product reviews. We were making pseudo-intellectual think pieces. The text of the review should consider what's interesting about a game, not just whether it was good or bad. And yet, we still tacked on numbers to the end of our reviews, and the numbers seemed to matter, at least to the editor. I can think of two reasons for this focus. The first is simply practical. We were getting review codes from game companies for us to, you know, do reviews of their games. So the number communicated that we held up our end of the bargain. The second though, I think speaks to an archaic understanding of reviews. They need to be accompanied by scores or else what are they? Just like talking about a game for a dozen paragraphs or so, the score legitimized the writing and in a surprisingly backward way seemed to prove what the reader read mattered. Here at I Am Error, we generally attempt to holistically consider games apart from their quality as consumer products. At no point will I consider in any terms if a video game is good for your money or really even worth your time. I mostly try to explain why it was worth my time and why I find it significant, interesting, and meaningful so that you can help better think of games as vehicles for meaning making. Meaning drives our discussion, not value. Yet, the only earnest answer I can come up with to the question of whether or not video game reviews are art reviews or product reviews is kind of both. Video games are expensive, and as a child with limited financial resources, these magazines helped ensure that I was getting the most interesting games for my dollar. If I could play all the games, if time, energy, and money were not factors, then the various magazines like Game Informer, Nintendo Power, Edge, etc. that I would read either in my bed or at Barnes & Noble would serve no purpose. But reading these reviews, taking in their scores, helped me make wise, well, kind of wise, <laughs> decisions with my bottom dollar. To imagine that the video game review score then serves no purpose because video games are art and above all that rabble kind of misses that lived experience of people who rely on such scores to help them make informed decisions as to where to spend their time and money. Yet, as the march of time continues, it feels such scores are becoming less relevant or needed for the average player for a few reasons. The first is the massive impact the internet has on games. Yes, there are way more reviews out there to catalog as evidenced by sites like Metacritic or a platform like Steam itself which lets users review its games, but more importantly, the amount of exposure one can have to a game before getting it is infinitely more than 30 years ago. A video game magazine had a kind of sacred duty to translate the experience of a game into written word for those who had no other way to experience it. But now you can just look up Elden Ring gameplay on YouTube and bam, you're experiencing the game firsthand. Take into account massive Let's Play accounts like Markiplier or PewDiePie, and now you're basically experiencing it with a friend. While such videos are not a substitution for playing a game, they definitely drive sales of games, specifically because people get an idea of what they are about and decide that, heck, you know what? That might be for me. The review score and reviews in general lose their relevance as an arbiter of quality the more players can simply experience the game before they have to purchase it. 
This also applies to the bevy of free-to-play games like Dota or League of Legends, with little opportunity cost to taste testing it yourself, and to demos one can download for free. As we move into the 2020s, another specter is limiting the appeal of the video game review. Game Passes. Game Passes allow you to simply play games with only the fear that you might have a bad time, but even still, the opportunity cost is mostly evaporated. As someone who primarily cares about the experience of playing games and not necessarily their ownership, I love my Game Pass. But more critically for our conversation, Game Passes kind of make the discussion of review scores moot. Here, I'm going to let Jeff Gerstmann of Giant Bomb take it away. Last year, he reviewed Halo Infinite, and while it started out as a traditional review, it ends up asking, what's the point of this review? The game is free on Game Pass. Gersman writes, When the game is free, we're not reviewing to help save money. We're curating to help save time. And this sort of information is often best conveyed in other forms, like our podcast, for example, or quick looks. As games get bigger and bigger, as the medium spreads further and further, the game-specific publication is only for the diehards. Those diehards, you diehards, don't need your hands held the same way people did 25 years ago. You've already consumed enough information about an upcoming game to know most of what you need to know before it's out. All you really want to know is, does it live up to the hype? Again, you don't need a score or a review to actually answer that question. So it's well past time for us to leave the product review behind. If Gerstmann, who's been writing game reviews since the 90s, has this take, we can be pretty sure game reviews have given up the ghost, can't we? Still, I want to conclude this part of the section by asking a naked question. What does a game score? whether tacked on the bottom of a review or aggregated by a site like Metacritic, actually tell you. If it doesn't matter whether the game is worth your money or time, the only reliable pillar to fall back on is how good the game is. But goodness isn't just subjective, it's a pretty meaningless distinction. If I tell you a game is good and leave it at that, I fail to communicate much of substance to answer what's interesting about it. Why does it matter? How does it play? Similarly, if I tell you a game is bad, I also fail to communicate much of substance. In communicating why they think a game is good or bad, a reviewer usually tends to tell the reader more about their perspective and taste than the game in question, simply by virtue of what they land on. But the score itself doesn't really tell you much. A quick note on the idea of the objective review, many commentators claim to try to write articles or make videos proclaiming an objective viewpoint. It's easy to dismiss these commentators by saying, art's subjective, doofus. And while that's a perfectly fine argument to make, I don't think it reaches them on their terms. So I'll take up the cause for just a moment. Objective reviews do exist. And by that, I mean a review which rigorously adheres to a specific criteria. So for instance, I could say that in order for a game to be great, it has to have X amount of mechanics. Its open world needs to be at least this big. It needs to be not too short, etc., etc., etc. We run into a lot of problems here, but if you set up external criteria, then compare a game to those criteria, you are in a sense doing an objective review. But we ultimately come to two problems. First, the criteria themselves are subjective. So even though you're trying your damnedest to be objective, you were knocked off before you even started. But far more importantly, games are just too complex to come up with a meaningful set of criteria with which to grade them. Any set of criteria you try to subscribe to will ultimately fail to adequately describe anything new a game could do. Thus, it will always be striving after some vision of the past's good game design, rather than looking toward the potential of games as a medium. So no, there isn't much point in trying to objectively review games even if you could objectively review them, and no review score is reflective of a game's objective merit. The whole conundrum reminds me of some advice I got when I first started teaching. 
note, if you don't know, I'm a college instructor by day, that when grading papers, different teachers will often point to different problems in a piece of writing, even when grading the exact same paper, but usually will end up landing on the same grade despite their differences. This doesn't mean the comments aren't useful. In fact, they're the only part of grading a paper that matters. But it does mean the number assigned with them is kind of just hanging out. We get a vibe of the quality of the paper that's generally within the parameters of what we understand as good writing, and we go with that. Isn't this what reviewers do too? They get a vibe like, hey, this fits within our cultural conception of what an 8 out of 10 looks like, so let's go with that. But as I've already noted, those vibes are going to be different for every reviewer, casting the whole process and aggregation of such scores as suspect. Simply put, I just don't think a product review can tell you if a game is great or interesting. In broad strokes, I'm sure the games that get higher scores are more likely to be better games than those below them, just like how the papers graded with higher scores get are probably better than the ones below them, but the scores or grades themselves don't really tell me why I should actually care about any given game. Returning to Elden Ring, what do we gain by calling it a 10 out of 10? Not much at all. I can think of two cases for deciding the game is not a 10 out of 10, and I plan on laying them both out for you to decide. The first is based off traditional video game review ethos. A 10 out of 10 denotes a perfect game. An Elden Ring is no perfect game. It's incredibly long, probably too long, as some areas become major slogs, especially in replay. Some sections are prohibitively difficult for the average player. There's little to no accessibility options for disabled players. The amount of freedom and the nature of Souls games as notoriously unapproachable makes it easy for the player to get in over their head in an area that they just frankly shouldn't be in, but don't realize they shouldn't be in. The tailoring mechanic totally fails to deliver. The game's balance is all over the place, as we've already noted. The PC version of the game launched with serious bugs and issues. The game often completely crashed my audio interface, becoming a glitchy mess until I unplugged and replugged it in, and in one instance the game straight up just crashed my PC. Players can leave messages at the bottom of ladders or levers, and that makes them incredibly annoying to operate. The crafting system is almost entirely unnecessary and feels tacked on. It's just feature bloat, really more than anything else. The early game doesn't have enough unique armor to discover. The level design simply just isn't as good as more curated from soft games. The underground dungeons feel almost randomly generated rather than intentionally designed outside of a few really amazing standouts. On replay, 90% of the game's content becomes redundant because you'll never want to go do it again after your first time doing it. On launch, some of the character's quests were not fully programmed into the game, meaning it was not only perhaps flawed as a game, but unfinished? Wow, that's a long list of complaints, and guess what? You may have your own not even listed here, or you might not agree with them all, but if we can see that one or a few are genuine, then can Elden Ring really be a 10 rather than, I don't know, a 9.9? .9? Exactly when do we demote a 10 to a 9.9 .9 might be up for debate, but there are enough angles of attack on Elden Ring, a profoundly ambitious game that simply can't accomplish all it sets out to do because it sets out to do just so damn much that it's quite difficult to argue the game is a 10 in any meaningful way. Elden Ring is just not perfect. It's got too many holes. It's too ambitious. It cares too much about doing everything. Yet, I did promise another angle for why Elden Ring is not a 10 out of 10, and this argument hinges on two important facts. The first we've already covered in great detail. The phrase 10 out of 10 is, well, kind of meaningless. If game review scores lack any real substance, then the phrase 10 out of 10 is insubstantial. It fails to tell us anything meaningful about Elden Ring. What kind of game it is, what it means, why it matters. It's just a blunt numerical instrument claiming abject and meaningless importance. But the second fact remedies this, because Elden Ring is more than a 10 out of 10. In its holes and in its glories, it's far more interesting than a great review score can describe. It's more valuable than a best games of all time list can explain. Elden Ring contains interesting insights into gaming culture, why we play games, and even the nature of freedom. 
Surely something so engaging, so fresh, so fulfilling is not just a 10 out of 10, not simply a great Metacritic review score. Throughout this video, I have sought to prove that Elden Ring is more than a 10 out of 10 by diving headfirst into different aspects of the game, its relationship to gaming's past in Legends of Zelda, how it opens the door for interrogations on meanings of balance, how it reinvents the loneliness of single-player gaming in its Freudian double, the Mimic tier. In each section, I hope I've shown you that Elden Ring is more than a number on a spreadsheet, more than just the game of the year, but a profoundly meaningful and memorable experience if you're just willing to dwell on what it's trying to say and what it even accidentally says. Elden Ring's sense of freedom expands beyond its physical space, its gameplay, or even its narrative and themes, though it's certainly there. You're free to let it invade your thoughts, expand your mind, to sit there and stew. It may be young, and there may be much more to say about it from people much smarter than me, but I hope you see that Elden Ring is free to be more than a number on Metacritic, or at the end of a review. It's far more interesting than such a number could ever allow. And an extra special thank you to my top patrons, Maximus and Lily Noah.